the majority of the world by population, all the central banks representing the majority of the world by population, is really dumping our currencies. This is a very serious point, which, uh, of course, we don't really fully appreciate, but we will discover to our cost. We will wake up one morning and suddenly realize what the hell's happened. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for July 8th through July 15th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature 2024 American Silver Eagles at just $5.95 over spot. Next, we have backdated gold one-tenth ounce eagles at $39 over melt per coin. And finally, we're offering dealer's choice constitutional silver half dollars at $2.50 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always delighted to have this distinguished returning guest, Alistair McLeod, a former bank director and the head of research at goldmoney.com, and now the founder of McLeod Finance, joins us this Tuesday, July 9th, 2024. Alistair, thank you for coming back on Liberty and Finance. That's my pleasure, DK. You have often visited us in the past talking about strains in the banking system, strains on the equity and bond markets due to the necessity, uh, the reality of higher interest rates uh, rather than the artificially suppressed interest rate regime that has buoyed up the bubble of everything, stocks, bonds, and real estates over the past 40 years. This is coming to a head. And uh, there are many, many people that we're greatly concerned about whose financial futures are based on assumptions and dependent upon continued low interest rates or lowering interest rates to support the bubble of everything that supports their retirements, for example, and their pensions. Can we start off with, uh, though, first talking about recent action in the gold markets, because it's been quite noticeable to those who are watching that gold broke through about a month ago to new all-time nominal highs and has perhaps found support in that new range. Can you bring us your latest thinking and analysis of the gold price? Uh, yes. Um, it's in a fascinating um, uh, position because um, we know that the Chinese are continuing to buy even at higher and higher prices. But as I've, I've argued in the past um, on your channel, it's not a question of gold rising. It's a question of, of fiat currencies led by the dollar falling. Um, and uh, this is really why the central banks in Asia, and particularly uh, the uh, People's Bank of China, uh, have been selling dollars. Uh, what do they sell dollars for? Um, Euro? No way. Um, yen? No way. Um, sterling? No. <laughs> in other words, they're selling for real money, um, which has no, no counterparty risk, and they recognize that. Uh, as gold. And uh, so this is why everybody thinks they're buying gold. But in fact, what they're doing is selling dollars. Um, the conditions that are worrying um, the People's Bank and various other, particularly Asian central banks, is that they can see what's going on uh, with these Western currencies. They're fiat currencies. And uh, the governments that issue them, or their central banks, but certainly the governments that, um, uh, that, that, that are responsible for these currencies are in debt traps. I mean, you know, in the UK, we've just elected um, uh, a left wing uh, socialist government, Labour Party, by a landslide. Uh, and um, they are committed to renationalizing the railways. They're committed to basically spending an awful lot of money, which uh, they haven't got. They're assuming they can raise it from taxes. But already we see that, um, you know, uh, non-domiciles, in other words, these are the people who um, are going to be taxed from next year as if they, you know, on their worldwide earnings, as if they were, you know, sort of, um, actual uh, residents and uh, uh, British nationals, if they live here, they're going to get taxed to hell and gone. So they're going away. Um, private equity are going away as well, because uh, there's a special deal which allows private equity individuals in the private equity in, in industry to pay a 20% tax as opposed to a 45% tax. That is, a, that, that is uh, pledged to be ended by the Labour Party. So they're going. 
So it's a question of the last one out, please turn off the lights. I mean, that's happening here. And we've got debt to GDP of around about 100%. It'll go rapidly up towards 110, 120%. France has just, um, by some uh, uh, abracadabra, managed to uh, get um, a far left-wing um, socialist communist socialist uh, um, administration uh, in control of the parliament. Uh, and uh, that all in the name of keeping out um, uh, Marine Le Pen and, and uh, uh, her uh, right-wing party. Um, and they're going to be spending like mad. I mean, the first thing they're, they're talking about is um, reducing the retirement age, uh, which Macron tried to raise. And there were riots all over the place. So we're going to see riots in France again and all the rest of it. I mean, the whole thing is just crazy. So that's the euro. You know, so sterling, no, don't want to touch that. Euro, no, don't want to touch that. If you look at um, the yen, as I look at it at the moment, as we're talking, it's 161.35 um, to the dollar, uh, almost a new um, low matching last week's low point. Um, and that is going to go lower. Why? Because um, while the J Bank of Japan is talking about, um, you know, looking at the interest rate situation and maybe raising them a little bit, I mean, they're not going to raise them really. Um, if there is any change um, in, a pol in, in monetary policy, they'll probably raise it by a quarter of a percent or something like that. And uh, of course, there's the good old USA, um, you know, with a debt to GDP of about 130 um, percent. And um, Foreigners selling the dollars, as I just said, particularly the People's Bank, uh, selling dollars. Um, you've got the Japanese institution selling dollars as well because they've got losses on uh, their bond investments in U.S. treasuries. Uh, so one way and another, there is a funding problem. So what does the Fed do about it? Lower interest rates? No, it's got to, it's got to keep them up because it needs the um, it needs people to. Um, uh, borrow yen, sell the yen, buy dollars, and pick up the carry trade. I mean, the carry trade at the moment is giving you a nice uh, sort of five five percent plus turn. Uh, and um, you know, as long as that continues, then it defers the funding problem of the good old US of A. So you can see that um, all is not well in the world. It's all very very distorted. Um, the idea, I mean, everybody's praying for lower interest rates because so much of the private sector is zombified. Um, without lower interest rates, government debt traps are being sprung. Um, we need to get lower interest rates. But the reality of the situation is that um, interest rates are not about um, managing the economy. They're about reflecting the loss of purchasing power of a currency. Uh, so, um, that's going to continue. And at the same time, because banks are trying to de-risk their balance sheets because they're very highly leveraged, um, what they're doing is uh, they're raising rates against anyone who wants to borrow. Um, that is assuming that um, they, might, they can be persuaded actually to extend any credit. So um, the idea that uh, this is a time when interest rates um, should be falling and all the rest of it, I mean, I'm sure the banks hope that uh, the central banks can muscle rates down because uh, they've got um, loans out to customers who are basically zombies. And uh, they, you know, their, their uh, business plans are just completely shot um, at this, these levels of interest rates because nobody expected them to come up here. But so that that uh, decay is a slow burning fuse, which means that um, uh, businesses are going to just go progressively into worse and worse financial conditions uh, with them becoming insolvent and going bankrupt. Um, this is not a sort of a happy time, but uh, what we're looking at, I think, at the moment is uh, the sort of situation of calm, but strong nasty undercurrents likely to sweep us out to our deaths and uh, you know by drowning at sea i'm sorry i'm mixing my metaphors a bit but you can see you can see where we're going it's it's um the the undercurrents are actually uh, really very very nasty in the current situation and then on top of that of course we've got um uh, the potential for war um in the middle east <clears throat> that's increasing i mean i understand that 
an, an aircraft carrier group has been sent by the uh, American Navy to the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, if that re results in an attack on Hezbollah, then that's going to bring Iran into into the situation. And that is very bad news. <coughs> if that happens, this recent rapprochement between Iran and uh, the other Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia, will go on the back burner, because as far as Iran is concerned, they will then shut the Straits of Hormuz and they wouldn't care too much about who gets hurt in that, because they are looking to protect their own interests, not the interests of the whole Arab world. So this is a difficult time, I think, geopolitically, certainly in the Middle East, and that could blow up any moment. And on top of that, uh, of course, there's the Ukrainian situation, and it is clear that we're not winning uh, on our side. We're not winning this proxy war. And it's interesting to see that Viktor Orban has taken the initiative as um, president of the European Council to um, go and talk to President Putin. He also went to talk to Zelensky. Um, uh, now, we don't know the details of the conversation, but I'm pretty sure that what he said to Zelensky is, look, you know, this is just complete lunacy. Um, you know, uh, it, it, are you really seriously prepared to stand by and watch your citizens being killed to satisfy the Americans? Um, you know, which is really what the situation is. Um, he's gone to visit Putin. He's spoken to Putin and he's now in um, or just come back. But basically, he's been t speaking to President Xi in, in Beijing. Now, um, all... Uh, his colleagues, if you like, in the European Council are saying, you know, this is this is absolute nonsense. I mean, how can he go off without the agreement of the Council and, um, you know, talk to these um, these enemies? So, you know, but the European Council do have a problem because gradually there is a recognition that they've got to find a way out of this problem. And uh, Auburn is taking the bull by the horns and driving the way out into, uh, if you like, um, some sort of negotiation to try and find uh, peace, uh, to try and effectively achieve, I think, what um, Putin has wanted all along, and that is to uh, drive a wedge between America and Europe, uh, and for Europe to look after its own affairs and not kowtow to, to America. So all these developments are going on. And then, of course, we have, um, I'm very sorry to say, um, an American president um, exhibiting all the signs of senile dementia. Um, I mean, I, 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 I read sort of off the record comments about um, about his dementia and how everybody's pussyfooting around him uh, when it comes to talking to him, because um, and this is a feature I've seen in senile dementia. Um, you know, they just fly off the handle. I mean, you say something which which is upsets them and all hell breaks loose. Um, you know, they go so angry. And so when you've got a president, um, you know, to whom everybody defers um, to have that thrown at you, you can imagine what it's like in the in the White House, all this sort of pussyfooting around. And uh, this is a man who. Um, uh, you know, allegedly his 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 wife is is refusing uh, to um, let anyone deter him from standing as president again. I mean, as a, as in this condition, he is absolutely he appears to be absolutely determined to stand as president. It's getting too late to find a replacement, really. And under these circumstances, we're going to see, um, if you like. Uh, you know, when we're likely to see Trump reelected. Now, I think that's a sort of two edged sword. Um, it's good for, um, you know, maybe improving the prospects of peace globally because um, Trump takes a rather different view of uh, Putin than um, the current establishment, uh, which was something e echoed, incidentally, by, by um, uh, Nigel Farage. Um, just before our general election, which, of course, got everybody up in arms. You know, the man doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's a Putin lover and, you know, all mm -hmm. that sort of mainstream media stuff is thrown at him. But it's an interesting point that he raised 
deliberately. He knew what he was doing uh, just ahead of the election. And I think it's a view which is actually shared by a lot of people on the quiet in this country. Um, you know, nobody loves Putin, but, no, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we we like law war even less. So, um, you know, I think that um, you know, the, the, if you like, the good side perhaps of um, Trump's uh, potential re-election as president is th is that aspect. But on the other side, I mean, he's 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 a spendthrift, um, and that's the impression we get anyway. So the debt situation is going to get even worse. He's also a trade, you know, he's, 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 he's very sort of insular, um, protective of American trade, American business, make America great and all the rest of it. And that is, um, that is going to turn out uh, as a big driver of um, prices or put more accurately, loss of purchasing power of the, of the dollar on the domestic American front. So um, anyway, that's sort of quick roundup of, <laughs> what's all that's wrong, I'm afraid. You've covered a lot of territory there, and I was hoping to circle back on several of the points that you that you touched on. Uh, let's start first with the gold market. You've been telling us for years that people who are noticing, as they are, consumer prices rising, need to understand that the things that they're buying, whether it's home you know, food staples or medical services or whatever, or fuel for their car, these things are not what is changing. What is changing is the dollar is going down the drain, as are other fiat currencies at various rates around the world. And that that's what they need to understand the reality of. Some people say, oh, that's a meaningless distinction. Those, those are two sides of the same coin. But it's absolutely essential to understand that whether it's gold and silver, whether it's oil, whether it's foodstuffs, et cetera, these real things are just being what they are. And it's the fiat currencies that are going down the drain. Uh, so that we shouldn't be preoccupied with the prices as much as we are preoccupied with the destruction of our earnings, savings, and retirements that are being forced upon us, uh, and frankly being pushed into higher tax brackets and all the all the rest of it, and false capital gains taxes, etc. Um, now, you took it one step farther today in saying uh, that what when people notice the rising gold price, as they have over the past quarter, they shouldn't uh, be fixated on that as the gold price itself but realizing that it's the dumping by China, for example, and others of US treasuries, US dollars, in order to hold on to something real. This is the action. This is the actual action that is being taken, is the accumulation of physical uh, and repatriation and, and holding it close, closely uh, by China and others. Uh, any other thoughts and, and uh, details from you on that point about the accumulation of physical metals by China and others rather than us being uh, you know, so, so preoccupied with the rising price that we miss the point of that that's a side effect of what's actually happening. Yeah, um, I think the general point is that usually it is foreign holders of a currency who are the first to recognize the weakness in that currency. Um, and this is basically what we're seeing. Um, foreign holders, will sell their positions down in a currency if they feel that that currency's purchasing power is going to decline and there is not sufficient interest, if you like, in the form of you know, the, the discounted value today compared with tomorrow reflected in interest rates to compensate for that, you know, what they believe they are likely to lose in terms of capital value uh, on, their, uh, on their holdings. So, um, I think that's the important point to notice. It is foreigners who are the first to recognize this. Second to recognizing this are the domestic users of the currency. They are always reluctant to appreciate that the changing values in between, um, you know, goods and, um, you know, the currency, they are very reluctant to realize they refuse to realize that the change is coming from the currency side and not from the goods side. The foreigners recognize it because they have no interest other than a speculative return, perhaps, or in the case of the dollar, which is a reserve currency, where we need it for trading purposes because um, if we're going to go and buy platinum or 
aluminium or whatever it might be, uh, we've got to pay in dollars. So we've got to hold a reserve of dollars. But if they didn't have that, they wouldn't hold the dollars. It's as simple as that. Because a foreign currency is a foreign currency. The only reason for holding a foreign currency is because you expect it to go up in value or you have a particular use for it. You do not use it in the course of your normal day-to-day -day living. This is why the foreigners are selling it. Now, if we look at the Chinese situation in particular, we can add two further layers onto the problem. The one is the determination of China and its partners in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and also BRICS to do away with using the dollar or depending on the dollar for their trade. The trade between them, the purchases of commodities, uh, let's say, within their club, their, their um, sphere of influence, they want to do away with that. So that's the first thing about it. The second thing in particular is that Chinese nationals cannot hedge out of the Chinese yuan in, through any other mechanism other than buying gold and silver. Now, this is important because household savings are reckoned to be 35% of China's gross domestic product. That is the equivalent of $6 trillion. That is being saved annually by households. What are the investment alternatives? Well, property. Yesterday's story. You can scrub that one. Um, the stock market. The stock market has looked better this year, but this is after three years of falling and significant falls. And consequently, that is not likely to appeal to a general public, except in a very marginal sense. This is why, up until now, what they have been doing is putting their money into what are called certificates of deposit, which in China is a slightly different thing from what we know as certificate of deposit. A Chinese certificate of deposit is basically a savings account offered by a Chinese bank uh, to Chinese savers, which allows them to lock in uh, their savings for up to three years at an enhanced interest rate. So that is just about the only investment alternative to property, which is yesterday's story, and stocks, which has very, very limited interest. These banks, however, also offer gold accounts. Now, what this basically means is that any individual who has a figure like 500 or 600 yuan, so we're talking about 75 to 80 dollars equivalent, can open a gold account. Now, that gold account basically will pay him in yuan linked to the gold price. So what does the bank do? Well, the bank, I suppose, can run a fractionally reserved system on the gold accounts, and I'm sure to extent they do. But I don't think they're going to run a fractionally reserved um, account system on, uh, in terms of gold liabilities to the extent that they would with a fiat currency over which the central bank has some control, considerable control, and can bail banks out if things get difficult. So generally, and particularly when you see the gold price being firm, when you see the demand for gold, not just through these banks, but also through deliveries or what they call withdrawals from the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and also growing speculative interest on the Shanghai Futures Exchange, you can see that as far as the entire financial system in China, that is now angled towards gold prices, which are going to go higher and higher and higher, driven by this mountain of accumulated household savings, which sees gold as the way of getting out of their own currency and as all an alternative or, uh, to you know, the fashionable things of the past, like um, accumulating apartments in high-rise buildings, which you never use, but you never know you can leave, leave it to um, one of the family or whatever, and it's going to go up over time. So that is, if you like, a good investment. All that's gone. So, you know, it's all narrowed down to a mixture of, of gold accounts, 
the certificate of deposit, three-year certificates of deposit to enhance the interest, and gold. And that's what's happening. And so I think it would be wrong to say that Chinese individuals um, are buying gold because they see the dollar going down. Um, they're buying gold because they see gold going up relative to other investments. I think there is um, a distinct possibility that this could lead to a crisis in Western capital markets, because um, when we deal in gold and silver, we are dealing predominantly in paper equivalents, which in theory are deliverable at the end of the day in gold or silver. But all the physical stuff is basically walking out of the door. I mean, you just look at the deliveries um, on COMEX, um, you know, virtually every day, uh, there are contracts stood for delivery. And we're talking about substantial quantities. Um, gold is also leaching out of London. Um, it's more difficult to um, uh, actually sort of, if you like, track the numbers there. But we just do know that all this gold and silver is just going out of the door and it's no longer in our vaults. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a huge, great problem. It leaves us with, um, if you like, a gold um, bullion uh, community who are operating on the basis of what they know, and that is really from Big Bang, 1980s onwards, when gold is just a counter, if you like, uh, a very good counter, um, and a source of enormous profits. It started off as um, the carry trade, rather like the Japanese yen today, because what you could do is you could lease the stuff from a central bank uh, at, a, um, at a lease rate cost of around about 1.5%, maybe 2%, and then you could stuff it into um, uh, US um, uh, T-bills, which uh, would be yielding you at that time, we we're looking at 7 or 8%. I mean, what's not to like? Leverage it up. And so gold was going out of vaults um, <clears throat> into the market and disappearing, never coming back. And uh, um, by process of elimination, um, I can say with some uh, confidence that um, the uh, US Treasury does not have gold it purports to have. And nor, um, I believe, does uh, the New York Fed have the earmarked gold, which it purports to be storing on behalf of um, foreign central banks. And we saw this with the difficulties they had uh, satisfying the demands of the Bundesbank, what, 10 years ago, to get a small amount of the gold held on their behalf, the New York Fed repatriated. Uh, so, and also every time... Um, you know, they take over organized regime change, whether it's Libya or um, Ukraine. You know, the, one of the first things that, that allegedly happens is that Black Hawk helicopter comes in with all these chaps dressed in black. They go and they raid the gold out of the central bank uh, vaults and then fly off with it. You know, this this has sort of happened uh, too often, if you like, uh, for it just to be conspiracy rumor. Um, it's it's uh, sounding a bit more like fact. So there is a shortage of gold in uh, official vaults in the West, uh, which is unaccounted for. Meanwhile, it's all gone over to China and increasingly Russia, um, which started in this game only really um, at the time of uh, the, the uh, um, special operation in Ukraine and sanctions. Um, at that stage, they stopped selling gold into the London market. Um, I mean, the, all this gold is just going out. It's just flying away from us. And uh, you know why? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's because um, the majority of the world by population or the central banks representing the majority of the world by population is really dumping our currencies. This is a very serious point, which, uh, of course, we don't really fully appreciate, but we will discover to our cost. We will wake up one morning and suddenly realize what the hell's happened. The other thing that you focused on in this, I wanted to drill into again, and that is that uh, the, contrary to the advice that most um, mom and pop investors in uh, retirement savers in the U.S. have been hearing from their traditional retail uh, investment advisors who say, stay in the market, 60-40 you know, stocks, bonds, portfolio, buy on the dips, it always comes back, you're going to get 7% a year, year over year on average and all that, that that has been true 
by and large, at least on a nominal basis over the past 40 year regime of falling interest rates. But U.S. was able, if I'm understanding you correctly, the U.S. was able to get away with driving down interest rates on the bonds without uh, foreigners significantly dumping bonds because there was kind of a carrot and stick. In this case, the carrot would have been higher rates, but they were withdrawing the carrot, but they were using the stick of you've got to, you've got to use the, the U.S. Uh, Treasury and the U.S. bonds for your trade settlement. You've got to hold you know, dollars so that you can have a reserve of of that for settling trades, et cetera. But now that the BRICS nations are wise to us and are rotating, pivoting away to a new new methods of settlement without the dollar, they no longer, the stick isn't going to be working anymore. And the, now the carrot may have to come back or is coming back of uh, higher interest rates in order to entice foreign holders of the U.S. Treasury without whom uh, we can't, they won't uh, keep financing the U.S. deficit. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the point behind it is that the rates will be set by the market, not by the central banks. I mean, the, there's no doubt that what the central banks want to do uh, is to get rates down. <clears throat> I mean, if the Fed could somehow manage rates lower and at the same time fund uh, the US government deficit, then, um, you know, they will be very cheerful about everything. But the reality is they can't get rates down. Why? Because the market is telling them, you know, uh, you've got a debt problem. And that is actually going to set, set the whole thing. There are two basic drivers of um, uh, interest rates. The first is um, the foreigner's view of your currency. And that is desperately important. And that is what we have been concentrating on when we talk about, uh, you know, is dollar, dollars going down rather than gold going up. And the second is that when banks turn cautious, then they will only lend at higher rates if they lend at all. The problem the banks have specifically this time round, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's a fluctuation that happens as part of the, the lending cycle. Um, it's a 10 year lending cycle, which you can trace all the way back to whenever statistics were sort of semi reliable. Um, but basically, uh, the banking systems are over leveraged compared with where they would like to be. I mean, it typically, uh, many of the GSIBs, the global systemically important banks in Japan and also in Europe, are up to 20 times leveraged. By that, I mean uh, the relationship between total assets to uh, equity. Now, that sort of leverage basically means that um, it doesn't take very much in the way of losses on your balance sheet to wipe out your equity. And of course, this is something, this is a topic which... Um, uh, American investors have been made very much aware of with the commercial real estate situation where values have collapsed and uh, banks have outstanding loans. And they've got, you know, I mean, they were lending as if uh, as if it was a normal mortgage, you know, sort of 80 percent loan to value type deal. Um, yet the values have collapsed to, what, 30, 40 percent of, um, of what they were. So. Banks have got huge potential losses, which um, they're finding extremely difficult to, to deal with. That is, you know, the, so they're not in the business of lending money cheaply anymore. Yet they realize that um, if you get higher interest rates, then <clears throat> the zombified economies, uh, which they have um, been encouraged to finance and have, been, have also, you know, walked into, um, you know, these zombie com companies are um, going to go bust. And even at anything a little lower than current rates, that is a process which is ongoing. This is, a, you know, we're going to find more and more, more and more businesses going bankrupt at anything like these levels. I mean, it's possible that um, the Fed might be uh, able to lower rates by a quarter of a percent or something like that, but I very much doubt it they'd even achieve that. Um, and I would have thought that um, if they try to do that, then the consequences would be even higher rates down the road. I mean, the idea that uh, inflation is over and, you know, which is a common story uh, um, in the investment community throughout the world. I mean, this is it's a joke. Of course, it's not over. The idea that the purchasing power of um, 
the dollar, sterling, euro, whatever, whatever, is going to stabilize. When governments are running massive deficits, in other words, there is more and more uh, currency being created, diluting the purchasing power of existing uh, currency. And then on top of that, you've got the uh, subjective value placed on currencies in this situation by foreigners. I mean, there's only one way for this to go. I mean, it, and it's not good. So that's where the saying uh, cash is trash comes from at, at the current time and has been for some time, but accelerating. Uh, you just touched on another thing. I want to focus in on the impact on the ordinary individual, the ordinary earners, savers, and retirees that have been assuming up till now that their uh, bank deposits, savings, checking, certificates of deposit, uh, contents of safe deposit boxes, uh, any dollar denominated uh, retirement uh, assets that they have are more or less safe. Uh, that's been the assumption over the past four decades. But now if banks are basically holding their breath, needing the Fed to cut rates to to resurrect their toxic bond portfolios and the uh, corporations that, that have had all these commercial loans out are holding their breath, needing the Fed to lower rates to prevent them from being exposed even further as zombie companies and having to default and turn into more toxic debts, which then uh, not only hurts their the stock market, but also hurts the the uh, bank's uh, bond port or, or loan portfolios further. How does this endanger the savings and earnings and deposits of ordinary uh, s ordinary people in the banking system right now? I think we've got to make a distinction between uh, bonds, equities, and uh, bank deposits, if you like. Um, bond yields are going to rise along the yield curve. And with debt traps, do not be surprised to see bond yields go way over 10%, um, which is more than double the current level. Um, how long it will take for that to happen? I don't know. But I had experience of this in the 1970s in the UK. And it also, it was an experience of uh, which, which Americans faced too in that decade, um, particularly towards the end of the de decade. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that if you're looking at equities, they take their value from two things, the availability of credit generally, and also the cost of that credit. Now, um, the cost of the credit gives you, um, if you like, that, that sort of um, is determined uh, in investment terms very much um, uh, by what the bonds yield. So if you've got rising bond yields, then that is going to destroy the valuation of equities. Um, and uh, the availability of credit, that's going to be contracting as well. So one way or another, I would expect a very severe bear market in equities. I would not be surprised to see equities lose over 70% of their value from current levels. Um, I'm not making investment recommendations. This is just how I see things. When it comes to bank accounts, um, it is a primary responsibility of the central banks to ensure that the commercial banking system uh, is sound. And you'll see uh, with what's happened with Silicon Valley Bank and so on and so forth that um, they have been rescued or deals have been arranged to ensure that deposit holders are protected from um, insolvency. That is a process which will continue. Now, it is an open question as to how that will be managed in a widespread problem. I mean, if let us say we imported a problem from another jurisdiction, for example, rising um, uh, bond yields in Japan, how that might um, undermine the GSIB banks, or indeed, a similar situation occurring in, uh, in, in, in the Eurozone with the Eurozone GSIBs, G which again are all sort of 20 times leveraged. Um, US banks, incidentally, about 13 and a half times leveraged. So that gives you a rough idea of the difference. The, the dangers from abroad cannot be ignored to the global banking system. Um, what we're looking at, I think, potentially is something which is far more difficult for the authorities to manage than uh, the great financial crisis, which led to the Lehman failure and those moments of um, 
sort of thinking that the whole system is going to collapse from underneath us. This is considerably more difficult. And I would have thought that um, I would have thought that the Fed and other central banks would ensure, will continue to ensure the integrity of the commercial banks. But the only way in which they can do that is basically by extending their credit as required. So what we would be seeing is instead of commercial bank credit being the bulk of what happens in an economy, it will be central bank credit, which becomes the dominant um, support, if you like, credit support in the economy. Now, that is incredibly inflationary in the sense that it undermines the purchasing power of the currency a lot more rapidly than the expansion of commercial bank credit. So um, you're looking at the two sides of this. Um, the one is that you may indeed be safe um, having your deposits in, um, let's say, a conservatively run uh, American bank, let's say something which is definitely too big to fail, you know, whether it's JP Morgan, Citibank or, you know, a wholly owned subsidiary of guaranteed by the parent. Um, I mean, that's that I think would be um, fine, but you, the loss of purchasing power of the dollar is likely to accelerate very, very substantially, which means that interest rates will be driven even higher, which means that the valuation of equities would be hit even more. So really, you know, this is a situation where there is um, what would turn out to be a widespread collapse, both of asset values, financial asset values, and also the purchasing power of the currency, which, of course, is why real money without counterparty risk, which is gold, and arguably silver still, but hasn't been since 1870, um, is actually the only protection that you should consider. Alistair, you write on a, on a prolific weekly basis. Uh, where can people uh, take advantage of your latest research? Um, the best way to do it is to subscribe to my Substack, which is alistairmcleodsubstack.com. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you can be prepared to pay $100 a year, you will get um, the best of information that I can possibly come up with. Um, and I would hope that you'd find that well worthwhile. Otherwise, if you're a free subscriber, then you will, you will get alerts. You will get some of the stuff. Um, but the real value, I think, is is to become a paid subscriber. It always is with these things. Um, you know, getting information for free is is you know has has a limited facility. Let's put it that way. So that's really where where, where most of my writing now is concentrated. I still act as head of research for Gold Money, and I publish um, uh, uh, particularly a market report on Fridays there, and a brief summary of um, my Thursday article you'll find there as well. And folks, if you don't want to miss a single episode with Alistair, make sure you get on our free mailing list at libertyandfinance.com. Just go to libertyandfinance.com, put in your email address, click submit. Make sure you confirm on the confirming email You'll get one email per day with our latest interviews. Every interview with Alistair will be in there. And uh, also, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, Liberty and Finance on YouTube, about half of our viewers are not subscribers and you may be missing notifications there. So make sure that you not only click the subscribe button on YouTube, but also click the bell icon so that you'll be notified of every video that we post there because we're posting at least six times a week, uh, sometimes more often, sometimes multiple times per day. So Alistair, on behalf of all of our viewers and subscribers, just uh, always grateful for you, your visits here with us, uh, educating us to what we need to be watching, helping us understand the connections between these things, especially globally here on Liberty and Finance. That's very much my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for July 8th through July 15th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature 2024 American Silver Eagles at just $5.95 over spot. Next, we have backdated gold one-tenth ounce eagles at $39 over melt per coin. And finally, we're offering Dealer's Choice Constitutional Silver half dollars at $2.50 over spot. 
To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.